Okay, so why, why don't you take it away? Sure thing. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniela from Ephraim Steinberg's group. And today I'm going to talk about uh, weekly measuring the time atoms spent in the excited state due to a photon they don't absorb. Uh, this talk will be basically me telling you about this result, but also telling you about the extension of this work and how we're doing, what things need to be in place in order to perform this new experiment and, and what progress have we made regarding those upgrades. So first of all, I want to tell you that in our lab, we use ultracovidin atoms as a medium to make photons interact with one another. And such interactions are manifested as cross-phase shifts. Here, for example, I'm showing you um, an schematic from a previous one of our previous works. And we implemented, in this work, we implemented a cross-phase modulation scheme using regular atoms and EIT, electromagnetically induced transparency. And what basically happened in this experiment is that this probe in here, here in red acquired a phase shift due to the presence of the signal. And well, not only that, but the size of that phase shift is proportional to the number of photons in the signal beam. And today I'm going to tell you how we harness these effective photon-photon interactions, or well, a different kind of photon-photon interaction, not, not based on Rydberg, but um, in order to answer a fundamental question. So first I want to start uh, by inviting you to imagine a photon passing through a cloud of atoms. In such scenario, two things can happen. One is that the photon can be transmitted and the other one is that the photon can be lost. And by lost, I mean that it is scattered in a random, random direction, different from the incident one. Some questions arise from this situation. And the first one is when a single resonant photon traverses a, a sample of two little atoms, how much cumulative time do atoms spend in the excited state? And the, um, some, of, some of you might say, well, the lifetime of the excited state. And then I would ask, uh, I would ask you if that answer depends on whether the photon is eventually transmitted or not. If the photon is transmitted, do atoms spend, spend any time in the excited state? Or could we infer that they simply got through with, without encountering any atoms? Well, this is a question about the history of a transmitted photon. And to our knowledge, it hasn't been answered in the literature, and we decided to try to answer it in this experiment. This is the toolbox for our experiment. So we need atoms. We have uh, ultra cold cloud of uranium-85. We have, we need photons. Well, we have lasers at 780 nanometers. And we need a way to weekly measure the, excita the excitation time of the atoms. And also a way to know when a photon has been transmitted. Um, let me tell you first uh, how we measure how much time atoms spend in the excited state. We find such time as the time interval of the excitation probability. And in our setup, that time is encoded as a phase shift in the following way. So first of all, here's a diagram of the two level atoms, uh, of the two level atoms we use in our experiment, where gamma is the, sorry, the decay rate of the excited state. Uh, a resonant beam here, this red one, called the signal, is going to go through the atoms. And we need to monitor the degree of the excitation caused by this signal. Um, for that purpose, we use this of resonant beam in blue called probe. Now let's talk about the probe alone. In this figure, I show uh, the face of the probe as its frequency is being scanned in the solid orange line. When the signal beam comes through a medium, it's going to weakly saturate the atoms. And as a result, the probe will see less atoms and acquire a smaller phase. And this is what I show here uh, in the dashed orange line, orange line. We set the probe around a uh, half a line width away from resonance. And if we subtract these two cases, um, then we would get uh, a phase shift. And this phase shift is gonna give us the information of the excitation time caused by the signal. And this phase shift mechanism is what it is usually called a kernel linearity based on, on saturation. And now let me stop here for a second for a parenthesis and tell you the initial motivation of this problem. Um, 
My group had worked with dispersive kernel linearities in the past and measured the effect of a transmitted photon to be the phase shift per photon. So basically the effect of a transmitted photon was the effect of the average photon. And in here, here's a diagram of the, of, of the level scheme they used. Uh, this is well known as N scheme. You can see it. it's evident by the shape. And this lambda in here uh, couples a weak probe beam and a strong coupling beam so that the probe is under EIT. The additional signal field here in green is the tune from resonance creating a, uh, a shift in the transition, like an AC star shift, that consequently imparts a phase shift in the probe. As, as, as I said, uh, the signal is, is responsible for the phase shift and is of resonant of resonance. And so the transmitted signal photons are correlated with the phase shift imparted on the probe. OK, so then we asked ourselves, what if the nonlinearity was based on saturation or loss? Like, are the transmitted photons correlated with the cross phase shift imparted? We didn't think the transmitted photons were going to be correlated, right? Since the cross phase shift in this nonlinearity relies in the absorption of resonance of our resonant photons. And this is how it all started. This is what started our curiosity on this subject. Uh, okay, end of the parenthesis, and let me get back to the toolbox for our experiment. To monitor if photons are transmitted, we collect the signal photons after the interaction region and send them to a single photon counting module. Now, this is how our experimental setup looks like. Uh, we send in a probe uh, and a signal kind of propagating through a cloud of atoms. The signal is resonant and it is pulsed. Uh, this, for reference, uh, in frequency, these pulses are eight megahertz wide and the atomic transition is six megahertz wide. So broadband. Um, and we collect the probe. So here we collect the probe and measure its phase using IQ demodulation where we extract the quadratures of a bit node. We collect the signal and send it to a photon detector. And finally, we correlate those two measurements, the phase uh, of the probe and the, and the photon detection. To isolate the effect of a transmitted photon, um, one would normally send just a, sing a sequence of single photons and then monitor the exact state population or like, measure the phase shift then detect which photons are transmitted, and finally average the phase shift for trials where a photon was transmitted, call this like phi t, and com compare it to the average phase shift. However, <laughs> a single photon source compatible with the atoms usually produces photons at rates of tens of kilohertz, which are very slow for our experiment. Instead, we are going to use coherent states and pulse selection in the following way. Okay, so first imagine a weak coherent state, like the one that I have in here, and place a detector in front of it. If the detector fires, that means that there was at least one photon in that pulse. This idea carries on to larger coherent states under a low detection efficiency condition. What I mean is that the revised mean after a click will increase by one respect to the original size of the, of the coherent state. Another way to see this is by considering a low efficiency detector. So here I'm showing a model for it made up of a perfect detector and a highly reflective beam splitter. When a coherent state goes through this, this, <laughs> this beam splitter, uh, the two output modes are uncorrelated. And this allows us to conclude that if we detect one photon here in, transmit, in this transmitted mode, then an extra photon, uh, that extra photon must have come from the input mode. This technique, technique was developed by my group and has been used for two major experiments that I are showing here. For even further clarification, I present this figure that shows um, the two probability distributions. The blue is a Poisson distribution with mean of 0.5. So say, sorry, sorry, with mean, uh, with mean five, five, fo five, five uh, photons on average, for example. And the orange one uh, shows the distribution condition on a detection we can see that the conditional distribution is shifted up by one. 
Okay, so now let's see what this means for our experiment. When we detect a photon, the number of photons increases by one. That extra, that extra one coming from the contribution of a transmitted photon, right? So the phase shift when the detector fire equals the photon number in the signal, this uh, alpha square in here, times the phase shift imparted by an average photon that I call phi naught, plus the contribution of it of the transmitted photon phi t. In contrast, so basically the average effect plus the transmitted photon effect. <laughs> in contrast, the unconditioned phase shift only contains the average effect. If we subtract these two cases, uh, we are able to isolate the effect of a transmitted photon on the excited state population. Okay, so this is uh, what the experimental cycle looks like. We start uh, by trapping the atoms and cooling them, and then take some reference cans, and finally sending a stream of uh, 1500 pulses where we monitor the detection here, click, no click, and so on. And, and the phase are uh, simultaneously. So detection and phase, okay? Then we bin our results in this way and average the phase of the trial where there was a click and average the phase where there wasn't a click and subtract them. So our, of course our, our experiment didn't require, it didn't require five shots, but billions of them. And it took about 500 hours of data Reason, the reason is that that effect, that phase shift per photon is very small in comparison to the noise of our, of our phase measurement. So in this case, I'm showing you the pro, the pro phase shift for uh, a pulse of uh, 34 signal photons. And you can see that the peak phase shift is something like 550 microrad. And then if I take that divided by 34, I get something like 16, mi 16 microrad. And the noise of our phase measurement is something like 100 millirad. So, or 120 for this case. Um, okay. So, um, I'll. I was just saying how the experiment consisted in subtracting the phase shift of the trials where there was a click minus the ones where there wasn't. But like we all know that experiments are never that simple, right? <laughs> so in, in our case, we had a, a lot of sources of noise and then, but to make things simpler, we, we classified them into two two kinds. And the first one is uh, fluctuations affecting both the linear phase shift of the probe and the transmission of the signal. Uh, this is in short time scales within uh, just one shot. For example, oscillations in the energy level so that the energy levels are shaking. Um, and also the second kind is fluctuation affecting, affecting the linear size, sorry, the size of the nonlinear cross phase shift and the signal transmission. For example, atom number fluctuations. And um, well, uh, now I, I want to show you one example of the first kind. So linear phase shift of the probe and the transmission of the signal. And um, just to, to like, uh, make an example of the challenges we ran into to complete this, this measurement. And if you would like to know more about the second kind, I, I invite you, I invite invite you to read our, our preprint. Okay. So let's go back to this figure where I was showing you the face of the probe. Okay. Imagine the probe uh, starts at gamma over two, minus gamma over two. <laughs> in frequency, and that the energy level fluctuates, making the probe see a different detuning. This would not only affect the quantity phi, which should be in the same, taken at the same detuning, but also the signal transmission, right? Because then the signal will see more or less absorption depending on where the, the level shifted. And well, this, this, this kind of noise uh, would introduce fake correlations that we are not interested in. And in our case, for example, this noise uh, ultimately caused, caused slow oscillation, oscillations in the effect that we were trying to measure. 
And I'm here, I'm presenting that. I, I don't want to take up much a time with this, with this plot. What I want you to see is that these oscillations that are produced by those by those no, by this kind of noise get smaller as you decrease the the pulse length. And that's why at the end we, we did this experiment with short pulses that I was just showing you for 10 nanoseconds, right? Good. But we, we tried our best, right, with, uh, by going to short pulses. But still, we, we, we got, we still have a background, a small oscillation, sorry, uh, yeah, a small oscillation in the background. And we need a way to distinguish this from the effect we're interested in. So in order to do that, um, we fit our data to a peak function plus a QIC function. The QIC function is, is basically, we basically fit to the background and the peak function is this, this little, this little hill in here, okay? But it's not just that, <laughs> actually, uh, well, we can, we can take a look at this peak function. This peak function is made up of a, a, an error function, so the rising, the rising part is an error function and the decay is an exponential decay. So this is, uh, I haven't told you still like what this data is. So the, um, we're interested is in this, in the lower part of this, of this figure, this is the effect we're interested in, but we use the non-post-selected data to get some of these parameters. And then we do a fit. And which parameters do we get from the non-post-selected data? We get uh, the rising time and the k time, and also where they where they pick. So this tau, uh, this t t naught. So we would take these three parameters from the non-post-selected data. So just the the phase shift uh, on the probe. That's it. Uh, and and then we fit uh, the. Our, our delta delta phi uh, to to this to this sum, okay. So basically, the three parameters will be the ones concerning the QIC polynomial, and the this parameter in here, which is something like the peak of this of this uh, hill. So basically, this is pretty much the most important parameter in the fit. Okay, so. Um, just uh, for reference, uh, I want to say that these plots were the result of averaging six billion shots. So six, the result of six billion signal pulses is contained in here in this in these plots. So after we do this many many times and and uh, take a lot of data and six hundred and five hundred hours of data, we arrive to these results. His uh, weighted average of delta phi, uh, so the effect of the transmitted photons, and it is a weighted average between 30, 34 and 134 photons in the signal. And this is basically a phase shift imparted by uh, a transmitted photon as a function of time here in units of phi naught. You can see that this effect is non zero. And as a matter of fact, we found that the excitation time due to a transmitted photon is uh, 0.77 of the excitation time caused by an average photon and respect to your spontaneous lifetime is 0.46. Okay, uh, so to summarize our results, uh, uh, the fact that tau t is bigger than zero shows that photons that are ultimately transmitted spend a significant uh, portion of time as atomic excitations. And we attribute this observation of excitation without loss to coherent for emission related to a phase split, uh, broadband poles picks up when propagating through a thick medium. If you want to know more about this, um, I invite you to read about zero area pulses, which I, I saw some familiar pictures in the previous in the previous uh, presentation. Okay, so let me talk uh, more about my results and so. 
this these are these are the this is the result again along with some theory models we have come up with this plot shows phi theory phi naught as a function of p d you can see how we only have one data point uh, for a broadband pulse and an od of four and these three curves are predictions given by toy models we uh, semi-classical to toy models so let's take a look at this uh, blue curve uh, from and this is what we call the it, this is extracted from something we call the egalitarian mo model and in the egalitarian model um, we take seriously the intuition that light is in an electromagnetic field that polarizes atoms irrespective of whether they are ultimately transmitted or, oh, sorry, it is ultimately transmitted or lost. Lost and transmitted photons have the same effect on atoms, but transmitted, the transmitted light uh, is able to interact with the atoms through the entire sample. Meanwhile, lost photons are on average lost uh, after the, the first OD. The second model in here, uh, these dashed lines, uh, is, is referred as the minimized coherent emission model. And it relies on solving the Maxwell block equations that under certain conditions uh, predict that predicts that atoms will decay at a rate faster than spontaneous decay. Uh, conditions like, uh, sh like uh, short pulses and uh, thick medium, right? And we add some assumptions by hand and extract a time spent in the excited state. I must say though that none of these models include post selection, so they don't really simulate our experiment. And we are currently working on a fully quantum treatment. Okay, five minutes. So we would like to complete the puzzle. And by complete the puzzle, I mean we'd like to know what happens for an arrow band pulse or lower ODs. Like that's the effect that would go to zero or what happens. And in order to do that, okay, I, I skipped too fast uh, here. So I want to say that lower ODs imply a smaller phase shift per photon and narrow band pulses undergo more absorption. And this means that if we wanted to complete this, this plot with more data points, more data, even more data will be required to resolve the effect. So we have done experimental grades in order to do that, to acquire the data faster. One of them is that in, we wanted to improve the SNR of the phase measurement by increasing the probe power. But the problem was that we had background detections. <laughs> so basically, you can see how this CW probe comes in here. And the mod reflects of photons that get uh, <laughs> coupled in the photon detector. And those probe photons are basically are, are uncorrelated with the, with, the, with the effect. like. They are parasitic and they are um, just um, contaminated our, our measurement, and so we can't increase. We couldn't increase the pro power if that was happening. So we try to filter the those that back coupling into this photon de detect detector, but we couldn't do it with polarization. Then we had to use time filtering. So basically, what we did was constraining the time window for the signal detection. So instead of looking for a click. <laughs> Uh, a signal click in 576 nanoseconds, we just uh, shorten that time window to, to four. And we can do that because the, the probe photons are leaking at any time, but the signal photons are only detected at a certain window. We also improved the data acquisition speed, transferring and storing. We got an EEG tizer and a two output IQ modulator. So you can see here how how, be, how much better we're doing now, 43 megabytes per second, and before it was 30 megabytes per second. And 100 atom cycles now are 27 megabytes, and before they were 37 megabytes. Recently, we came to, uh, to get more efficient duty cycles, and just by using the new data acquisition system, we can easily extend the atom cycles and take more data in each of them. Uh, if we if we have if we require lower ODs, and also well we we are now uh, trapping and cooling for less time. So again, we were at twenty percent efficiency in the duty cycle, and now we're doing forty four percent. Okay, so finally, getting all this together. Um, so, how much time it will take to, for example complete this, this data point, right? So if I get an OD of 2.5, that would 
uh, imply that we need three times more data because the phase shift is linear in the OD. Before we had an OD of four, now the 2.5 OD gives us three times more data. And it's not 1500 hours, no, because then thanks to these upgrades that I just described, we could take this data point um, in 100 hours. So now this is the summary of my talk. And for broadband pulses uh, in a peak OD of four, uh, we measured that the average time atoms spent in the excited state due to a transmitted photons is 77% uh, of the time cost by an average photon. We upgraded our apparatus to take data 16 times faster in order to explore other parameter regimes. And the results of this new experiment will further el elucidate the complex history of photons as they propagate to an absorbing medium. And thanks for listening. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? Could I ask a bit of a silly question? Daniela, how seriously do you take this 77%? In other words, uh, should I be taking away from this the idea that a transmitted photon spends less time than an average photon in passing through this medium? Less time, yes, I, 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 do, I do think so, yeah. I do, I do take it seriously, um, bro, okay, but you so can also say, maybe more like you can believe this more in terms of the phase shift, right? Like the phase shift imparted by a transmitted sure. photon is- that, That's yeah. fine. It's, it's not so much the interpretation as the 77% okay. or the 16 that I'm thinking about. So what about photons that don't get transmitted? Yeah. To make so, the average come out right, shouldn't they be spending 20% more time than- I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, or, I see what you're saying. Are the numbers sort of so different only such few photons are transmitted that so I'm curious to know how this works out. Yeah, so tau, you're basically asking me like uh, tau L and how much time tau L is like, uh, uh, when I say tau L, I mean the the, trans, the, the time spent by, by a lost button. Uh, so we can easily work out, work that out, right? For example, we have the transmitted, sorry, the, the average time that should be the average, right? This is the way right. I, I, I right. take that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So what is tau L then? Uh, well, I see. So it is it is something also like uh, like point. Okay, so it is for sure less than tau naught. And I remember something like 0.5 because it depends on these probabilities as well, right? So yeah, I remember this being something like 0.5 of tau, of tau naught. So you, yeah, so the, the photons are being scattered in the random direction faster than, than, the, than for example, the spontaneous lifetime. That's probably a, more, uh, a better answer to, what, to your question. Yeah, I'm it also is. trying to understand what Ephraim just said in the chat as well. And okay, uh, I agree, this is, this if, is if I can chime in thing. aloud for a second, I, I guess what I'll say is that mm -hmm. the um, the average time is kind of a funny thing. The most natural thing that we imagined was that transmitted photons wouldn't cause any excitation, but lost photons would involve exciting an atom, having it sit there for on average a spontaneous lifetime and then decaying. And in fact, the total time spent by all photons is just equal to the number of lost photons times the spontaneous lifetime. That does turn out to be correct. So as soon as we observe that there is some positive non-zero time spent by transmitted photons, the corollary is that the lost photons on average cause an atom to spend less than a spontaneous emission lifetime in the excited state. And that's why we need to think about what other processes could have driven the atoms down faster than the spontaneous emission rate. And that's where this coherent forward emission comes in.
Thanks. So it's a, it's a very fancy refractive index measurement. Yeah. Um, so is is the is there a way to do interferometry, like take part of the incoming beam and interfere it with itself after it's being transmitted through? Mm, okay, so let's go back to. So you mean take which of these beams and do interferometry? Um, because so, we have two, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the the one that's being transmitted that you're. Yeah, exactly. So the signal one, and and we, and why would we want to do different? Well, I'm trying to see if you can measure a phase shift after it passes through the medium. Maybe that's what you're already doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and we we do a phase shift. The phase shift measurement is with the blue one, with the blue one, right? I see. That's what okay. what's monitoring, and it is it is done by interferometry. It is done interferometry. Bit note, bit note interferometry. Yes. Right. So, so forward scattering takes less time than sideways. I mean, there's no, if I just think sort of classically of an aerial and I compare the phase shift to different parts of the, of the scattered wave, uh, I don't know if there's any effect in there or uh, this is more subtle, you know, almost certainly is way more subtle than that, but. Um, what? Okay. Do you have any uh, interpretation or uh, you've said or you're prepared to say at this? I, I, I think I said something regarding what you were just saying and it's that we, we attribute this, this effect to uh, forward coherent emission that is caused, uh, that is, yeah, that is uh, produced when this broadband pulse is uh, propagates through uh, an optical medium that is dense. And so what happens is that the frequencies that are close to resonance are absorbed quickly and then the, the remaining ones that are far off resonance then just propagate through. Right, so, so there's a distribution in, in frequencies of the incoming light and ones that propagate through more quickly are off resonant and the process is quicker, whereas the ones that get absorbed and then scattered uh, are perhaps on resonance. Yeah, those are. Is, yeah. is, is this? Can you correlate this effect due to the, the spectral width of your incoming beam? Mm, so you mean? Well, it is. It, it we expect this to be different if our our ex spectrum was different, right? For example, in here I show that, uh, well, maybe this is not the most correct model, but in our minds, we, like, sorry, but we have discussed that if we had a narrow band pulse, we expect some, this, this, this effect to be zero, but we're still waiting for that measurement to, to be done. So yeah, it, our effect, we think it depends, it has a, a, a yeah, a high dependence on the broad the, the the spectral width of of the pulse. And so, if you have randomly distributed scatterers, um, you get a. You say you if you have like n of them, n scatterers, you get this sort of n squared effect to, for forward scattering, and only mm -hmm. an n effect for um, non-forward scattering, if they're yeah. randomly due to interference. Mm -hmm. And so you're sort of, you're preferentially biasing the forward scattering, I don't, I don't know. I'm probably not making sense to myself or to anyone, but uh, as usual, I think I have to go and read the paper. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think we recently discussed one of your questions in, in my peer meeting. But yeah. There's all these messages from Ephraim going on in the background <laughs> and my brain is uh, full at the moment. Let's see. Uh -huh. It's not the only effect.
Mm. Ah, and there's a question from Ying Lei Zhang. Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, I have a. Um, can you hear me all right? I hope yeah. it's not too noisy. Yeah, so um, if I, just to make sure that I understood correctly, the only way you're using post selection is to separate all the data you collect into the two beans, click and no click, right? Yes. Uh, the, you're not using you're not using the the data dynamically. I mean, so for example, all the plots that you have shown where there is time evolution, you're not doing this. Uh, uh, yeah, you're not using any like post uh, selection and post measurement analysis. Well, I just yeah, I just take the ones. I, I just take the the phase shift where when there was a click and the phase shift where there wasn't a click. And mm -hmm. then I subtract those two, and that is from where I get my my result. Okay, I see. Um, so, because in general, if you have some um, some variable that you're measuring and you have these time time dynamics and you're probing all the time, it would be possible. There is this thing called past quantum state. It would be possible to use the the data from both before and after that time to to somehow reduce the the error you have at every single time. Yeah, I see. I see. Well, um, but I, that is something more. Yeah, it, it's not okay. what you did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. So I think there is another question by Kenneth. Yeah, I mean, Ephraim, Ephraim says that, yeah, I mean, the, the theory we're working on, of, it is based on weak values and it is based in, on pre-selection and post-selection, right? And then you look for the overlap of those, of your state going backwards in time, so to speak, and then with the one that's going forward. But that's, yeah, that's something that's in preparation. Yeah, yeah, I see. Yeah, no, so mm -hmm. yeah, my only observation was that you're somehow using yeah, only the final measurements and not the, the, the continuous measurement that happened before, right? But it would okay. be it would be something that could be done in principle. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Could you do something like sending a pulse that ionizes the excited state, but not the ground state in order to measure if the atoms are really in the excited state? uh i don't know uh i think i could i would need to chat with kenneth more about this question so he can explain me better but yeah okay, okay. More... If from, I see. Could I jump in with another question? Yeah. This is very simple. Does the temperature of the atoms do anything? Have you, what does the mark do for you other than give you a huge OD? I'm curious to know what happens if the Doppler width of the atoms becomes comparable to the natural language. Yeah, well, uh, we we our mod is at sixty micro kelvin, and so we don't we don't really care much about the 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 temperature effects in, in these in these regimes, right? So, yeah, and what else could it could happen? Hmm. If, now, the reason I ask is if there's any kind of uh, phase coherent forward emission going on. Mm -hmm. You would scramble that by making the Doppler width of the atoms become comparable to a natural line. And so, so that's, that's, that's what I'm curious about. Is if you heat up your mark, I wonder if this effect changes. It shouldn't, right? According to if, if there's no funny business, but uh, I'm curious. Yeah, I guess if the atoms do not interact with each other, I wouldn't expect that to affect our our measurement. I don't think so. Also, I have seen these uh, zero area pulses being formed in, in warm vapor cells. And yeah, that's, that's the answer I can provide to that, Amart. 
sorry, you've seen this, I mean, you've seen papers about it. I've seen papers where they create these urea pulses in vapor cells. Right, but I'm just, I'm not, I'm just asking a kind of uh, dumb experimental question. Oh, no, no. What happens if you crank up the temperature of your mouth? But probably that's not experimentally done yet. Mm -mm. No, we haven't, we haven't looked into that. Um, I just had a dumb question, which maybe you've already answered, but um, how did you ultimately um, decide on a rep rate? Like you said, originally it was 576 nanoseconds, and then in the next evolution, you dropped that by a factor of four, but um, what prevents you from going even shorter to increase your data acquisition speeds? Oh, okay. So, okay, let me see. Let's see those those slides. Because uh, one way, so I, I increased my data acquisition speed uh, in three ways, using three, three, three ways. One was by shortening the window where I, where I would be looking for, for signal detections because of, uh, um, because they only occurred within certain in time time interval, right? So that would allow me to increase my pro power and uh, uh, increase my SNR uh, in the in the phase measurement. And then I, I couldn't go further because um, the the detection without losing any any information, right? Because uh, that's like the factor of four is like the limit where I don't risk to lose any information. So like the clicks only happen within a, a fourth of these 576 uh, nanoseconds. That's one of the answers in the constraint. Uh, I, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to introduce funny correlations by going beyond those, those limits. And the other thing is uh, the, 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 the duty cycle of the, of, the, of the atom cycle is the other limiting factor. And that's, that's all I, could, I can think of right now. But yeah, because if we, depending on the OD, we can go beyond certain efficiencies. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so, so how do things depend on the thickness of the sample? Well, um, according to, oh, let's yeah. look at the minimized coherent model. Yeah, so as you go down in OD, it, it should uh, tau T, uh, so yeah. The phi t should go to zero, and you know, just to say that that's kind of the model that we think probably captures a lot of the physics. Although we can't prove that, as Daniel has said, it's not a quantum model, so we're we're hoping it captures a lot of it, but it probably isn't complete. And the the picture we have in our mind right now is that as a broadband pulse propagates through a dense medium, the different frequency components pick up different phase shifts and we end up with a pulse envelope that changes sign. And that's kind of the thing that gives us what Daniela was describing as a, a zero area pulse, or it gives us this coherent emission. And if we have a thinner sample, there isn't time for that phase flip to evolve. And that's why we kind of think it's reasonable that that effect wouldn't occur for thin samples. And in either that thin, you know, low OD regime or the narrow band regime, we still kind of think we'll get back to our original intuition that the transmitted photons are the ones that never got absorbed and this time will go to zero. And that's kind of what we'd like to verify. And this is kind of the Oswald extinction theorem or something where the pulse enters a medium and then it evolves. There may be the sum characteristic length over which it uh, evolves into to them propagating at the effective sort of speed you'd imagine due to the refractive index but that, that takes some 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 distance through the medium i mean th th you think this is primarily a, a single particle effect or a, a sort of collective <laughs> medium that that's a good question right but we have discussed this several times and we think that under this uh time type type of evolution Really, uh, since we think that it, it is highly dependent on the frequency profile, if we had a frequency profile 
that that was the same for a single photon or for a, or for a, a coherent state of well i don't want to say that but i just want to say that that the the spectrum would evolve in the same way uh, in, under this evolution, regardless if it is a, a, a coherent state or a, a truly a true single photon. It, it's certainly true that the transmission and the delay time, these are all linear effects. We expect those to be the same for a single photon or a coherent state. As for the thing we're measuring, uh, no, that's also unproved. And I was assuming from the beginning, and I still tend to believe that it would be the same, but Howard Wiseman, for instance, who's working with us on the theory, doesn't understand at all why I think that's true. So that's yet a further calculation and experiment we should do at some point. Um, the model that we're using here is semi-classical, right? So we, we, we can't make that distinction. And the experiment is in this funny intermediate regime where we have a coherent state, but then we post-select on one photon. But I, I, um, I would stress that there's a distinction between just the delay time and what we're measuring. Those are really different quantities. And I don't think there's any ambiguity about the delay time for the transmitted pulse. We're asking how much time integrated over the sample Adam spent in the excited state. And I don't think those are the same thing, even if in a simplistic model they would be, which in particular you see because the group delay becomes negative on resonance. And the time we're measuring is certainly not negative if you, at least if you include all the atoms, maybe under a particular post selection, it could. So they're just different things, I think. Great. I'm going to stop the recording.